you know, people was mad at the type producers, like, oh, type beat producers, because they figured out a way to market themselves without nobody. They doing something you ain't doing. Peace, what's going down? It's DJ Payne One for BeatStars.com, checking in with Denon, a.k.a. Mr. Porter. Amazing producer, amazing rapper with a lot of legendary history under his belt. What's going down, sir? Appreciate you sitting down with us and, and sharing your wisdom and experience. Man, thank you for having me, brother. So you're a rapper, producer, performer. What 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 else am I missing? Cook. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me see. I mean, executive. I've, I've executive produced a lot of records. I've mapped. I actually got into to composing, co-scoring, things like that. Oh, that's and, interesting because uh, in an interview, somebody asked you about that. I believe it was either Forbes or Billboard. They asked you if you'd ever get into film scoring, and you were kind of. Yeah on the fence about that so, so now you're all the way in yeah yeah just um it's hard because you know they have their own they have their own crews like you know what i mean so you have to kind of get into it so i'm just right now like scratching the surface i've done a lot of things like i just stumbled onto but i didn't know that's what that was composing at the time so you know i'm getting in there and i take it i take it take it serious now you know what i mean you had records in, in all types of films, though, too. You had Straight Outta Compton. You even had, I think, what was it, Shark Tales? Shark Tales. Uh, I, I actually co-scored Waist Deep with Terrence Blanchard. Like, it was really crazy because I did that, and then I forgot who the guy was that came in. I think it might, it might even been Def Jam at the time came in, and they kind of mixed it up and added a lot of stuff, too. But, um, yeah, that, and what else did I do? TV, a lot of TV. And Fast and Furious, stuff like that. Like, I, I worked, I actually created the song for the last scene for Fast, you know, for that last, Fast Five, I think it was. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's actually really fun, man, to see a script, see a movie, then create something that fits it. So it's really, it's really a cool gig. Let's go back um, a little while. Uh, Forbes magazine outlined some of your mentors, uh, which are some of the undeniably greatest producers in the history of our art form, Jay Dilla and Dre. Mm -hmm. What what were some of the most valuable lessons that you learned from from those experiences with them? Well, Dilla was like it was like being your own person. Like I think it was so many people in Detroit that sounded like him, and I had a sound that was more raw and you know wasn't as polished. I learned that polished sound from Dre later. Um, but then the, once I started learning it from Dre, I went back and started listening to more of what Dilla was doing. And I learned that, like just having a polished way of being rugged, like where it was like a kick may not be so rounded, but it's just you feel it. Right. So sonic correctness, I learned from Dre being calculated and learning how to be more calculated with what I was trying to do was what I learned from Dilla. So now I've spoken to a lot of producers. Uh and recently I spoke to Jay Reed who did Nicki Minaj's latest platinum single, Chun Lee. And I've mm -hmm. noticed that producers like him that, that make these beats that on the surface seem very simple in, in the sense that they're not overproduced, uh, but they're beats that, that just hit a pocket for a rapper. Um, I've noticed that, you know, and him included you as well. A lot of these producers are rappers, songwriters themselves. Um, and I don't want to call you just a rapper, but do you think that being a rapper, having having that art form under your belt, gives you an advantage as a beat maker and a, and a producer? Yes, absolutely. But it's also it's also hard to let go of some of that music too, because you hear yourself on it. That was something that I am just now, after all of this time, learned to not fall into. But um, it absolutely helps, man, because. I can make something that has a pocket and you can kind of tell the person like, yo, this is the, this is what I was thinking. Like, what if you, what if you started to flow like this or somewhere the pocket was like this? It definitely helps, man. It definitely helps because you can kind of make a song that sound like nothing else because you able to, you able to write it or at least start the idea. And a lot of times today, people like getting ideas like that. Um, let's, let's talk executive production. So the last Gold Certified Bad Meets Evil album featured a few songs that were produced by you, but I think more importantly, the entire project was executive produced by you and Eminem. And then also the, what, what Royce called his most important body of work to date, Book of Ryan, that was also executive produced by you. Those jobs are harder because 
when I first came in on Book of Ryan, we had started that before when we was doing layers. And I think um, that during layers, like it was a lot of music, even, you know, that you had that was like, it was just already there. It was perfect, right? Sometimes you come in and you hear that and it's like, okay, I don't want to take this piece and lose this piece or lose this feel. Like it was a lot of stuff I tried to work on that didn't work, right? And then we did layers and layers became that. Then Book of Ryan came and that was like, that was tough. Because when I came in, I had like one song. I had produced one song. And that's not something that you normally think about when you're executive producing, right? It was like, I just got finished working on M's album. We worked on Revival. I worked on Revival very close with him. Um, and when I stepped away from that and I went into Book of Ryan, Revival took a totally different turn even, right? Like it was a lot of songs that I think I felt that they needed, they felt they needed to have at the time and things like that. And that's kind of harder to do, you know, to step away from something. And I think what the, the, the beauty of it was going into Royce's album. And then I ended up producing like, I don't know, six or seven things. Like, cause I was fresh off of the revival joints and I had a lot of shit, a lot of ideas and then walking into it and, it just started becoming a story and we started putting it together. So that was really like that executive hat is a tough one, man. Cause sometimes you got to listen to other producers. Like I listen to your shit and be like, Jesus Christ. Like it, that kick on, it, it's like a kick, this kick you had, man. I was like, I, well, I forgot what beat it was, but he played this beat. And I was like, man, how do you get to kick the sound like that? Right. And I'm thinking about it as a producer when I should be thinking like an executive. <laughs> like, so sometimes it get in the way, you know? So I think the biggest thing when being an executive producer, I had to learn the first thing I had to learn was my ego got to be out of it. Cause it might be like M's new album. We did two records, maybe three possible that, that could have worked. He did and recorded one or two of them. I had to, we had, I had to, say, yeah, I'm going to take these off, right? That's a hard thing to do because most people won't be like, yo, let me take this record off, right? I mean, it's an Eminem album. Like, you know, in this album, people received it more than they received. They received it better than they received Revival, right? And I have records on this album. But I was actually, when he was picking the Mike Will beats, I was right there with him. Like, we was able to, I was listening. So I'm like, yo, you know, we was kind of listening to the beats at the same time. So, it's still an involvement that I had that it was like, and then I actually worked on a couple songs where I, you know, added a jump, add stuff here and there. But man, it's a hard thing to do when you got to switch from executive to producer. I could produce a whole album and it won't sound like the same person. I know how to do that. But I also know how to listen to music from other producers and say, yo, this is amazing. Like we need to use this. This is important. But let's take this end piece and connect it with this other piece. Right? No, and that's something you gotta learn. Your ego just gotta be out of it complete. That's interesting. So you took yourself off of the Kamikaze album for the sake of, of yeah. creating a, a more cohesive body of work, I guess you would say. Yeah, and just because of some, like let's say the content wasn't, the content was a little heavier than you know what I mean, or whatever the case. Like I think in business, that's my brother, so it's a lot different. So. With him, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be selfish and say, well, I gotta be a part of this and this way. I am a part of it because if you know, if I'm not, if I'm not producing it, if I'm not helping him put it together, if I'm not helping whether it's mixing or just listening, I'm performing it. We we coming up with different ways to do a show and make sure that people receive that well. So that ship, I already, I, I have to, I have to, I had to realize that I helped put legs on it, like. If I didn't do Just Don't Give a Fuck and a lot of other songs, that shit might not have happened, right? And I had to remember that, you know? So you got to be the big, bigger person and be able to be honest about it. And a lot of people wouldn't be in that situation to do that. They'd be like, nah, fuck that. I'm putting this record on here. Like, it's got to go. You got to be honest with yourself. If it's not something that's going to make both the, if it's not going to make that artist look good, don't do it. Take the L. If you miss that opportunity, a lot of people will be like, no, I ain't missing that because of the money or whatever. It's not about the money. It's literally my legacy at this point. 
So to keep um, on this theme of executive production, I read an interview you gave to Billboard magazine in which you discussed your role in Revival, and you've already spoken a little bit about your role in Revival, uh, mm -hmm. just beyond producing records. Um, and in this particular uh, interview, you, you spoke about suggesting the Beyonce feature for, for Walk on Water. So would you say you took a, an executive producer role on Revival as well? Yeah, I mean, it's just hard to, you know, it's hard to get that, I think, because there's so many, M's albums are so big, I don't know, and I'm so close to the ship, sometimes I don't even know if they even can see me in that light, but it don't stop my contribution. I'm never going to go to them, I think you, I, I think it's the, the worst thing, the worst feeling in the world is to have to go to somebody and say, hey, can I do this? The gratitude, the great, the great part about it is saying like, hey, we want you to do this, Right? And I'll keep going until I get that. I don't want no handouts. Like, I don't want that. You know, I want them to feel like it's like something. So my role is just always my role, you know, and I'm always playing big parts in it. So it's just to me, I don't I don't know if it if it ever really makes sense in that situation with others. Yeah, like a complete somebody saying, yo, we want you to produce this next executive producer, Travis Scott album or something like that, like going into something like that with knowing my track record. That's a that's a that's a that's an accomplishment, right? You know, with, like with like Paul being a Def Jam, right? I think something like him saying, "Yo, I, this kid, I want you to take this and I want you to do this and I want you to do this because I believe in what you're doing." Those are wins for me, right? Not me having to say, "Yo, let me do this, let me do." That. I just kind of do it around there because we it's a team effort, you know. Like Bad Means Evil was a different thing because. I might start the projects. I might by the last one I started it. Me and Royce pretty. Much, I started it, and we came in with the ideas, and then it was like they just and forth. That's you know that's how that went. But um, I like to work for it, man. So I can really feel like I worked for it, not having it handed to me. You know. So on that note, and I think I see it in the in the background actually. Um, fun fact about you: you're not just multi platinum. You're actually diamond certified. Yeah, yeah, like a couple times. <laughs> I, got a, I got a couple of those diamonds, yeah. I, I don't have a follow-up question. I just wanted to know, how does that feel? <laughs> feel? I mean, that's something that very, like the elites of the elites in the music world can say that they're diamond certified. They're, it's, it's a very um, small percentage of, of musicians. It's a great feeling, but it's always like, this is a new world, right? Streaming is king. I had a lot of streams that went number one from the Revival album for his, for the way that it was received. I had a lot of streams. Like I had songs, I'm still streaming songs from these times, right? So it's a great feeling like to be able to be a part of that, you know, to be a part of that, to say, and I'm still here. That's the, that's, that's what's most important for me. I don't have these things and I'm looking at them and it's like, wow, that was a great time in my life. <laughs> like, it's like, no, nah, it's always a possibility for that to happen again. And, I think that my track record, I'm just quiet, you know? I'm not really a, I'm not really a talkative person about stuff I do. So I think anybody that's in that position, you don't really, you don't really put it out there that you have it. You just are it and like somebody will ask you and then you, you know, you kind of give them an answer about it. I want to accomplish more now. Having, having, listen, having that many sales, that's insane. If you think about that today, that means 11 million people for just this album. And I think 50 cents, I had like 10 million or something. And then one of the singles was mine. And that's like more millions on top of that. You know what I mean? And so it's a crazy feeling because you can't really, you can't really do this again. So that's why I look at a lot of the stuff today and a lot of the padding of the numbers and, you know, it's not equating for producers. And I think that they got to look at that, man. Like a lot of the beat stars producers, that's one thing I want to bring to them is like, yo, listen, Let's start fighting for our, because without us laying that foundation, none of this is possible, right? So we, we got to start fighting for our right to have that. Because listen, it's possible. It's happening. It's not like this, this is impossible. It's just equating the streams and they don't know how they're going to pay nobody yet. But all the advertisement money right now is being accumulated by every label. All of these that are in this services are accumulating all of the money that you're supposed to get paid. But they're not not paying the producer, right? So if you don't fight for it or learn why it works, most kids just happy to have a plaque 
I see a lot of people doing the certified platinum thing. Sort of, a, it's like that's great, that's really great. But that's the way it works today. That's new. But is it equating for you in money? Is it equating for you in your longevity as far as how you're going to sustain your family and all of that? That's what's important. I definitely want to pick up on that because because obviously things have changed quite a bit and and there are I think more revenue streams for producers than ever. The the issue is that we just don't always get them or know how to get them or even know that they exist. But going back, um, you know, Infinite was the first Eminem album that dropped in 1996 and you had a major role in it. Like you said, if if you hadn't done that, who knows where you'd be now. Um, How would you say production and just the, the world of production has changed since back then? I listen to Infinite now and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. They just went back to being simple. When I was going to the river, I had to make it more complex. I had to make PIMP sound simple. I had to make Stunt 101 sound simple. It was technically simple, but sonically it was a lot of work. Now they're getting sounds that we created and we actually are creating, like I'm creating the sounds for some of these software companies. So they're getting already ready-made sounds. So they're not have to worry about the sonic correctness now they can just make something that's super simple they don't really got to teach themselves and then it's a huge thing because you already have most of the work done for you i had to do that work right so that's one of the differences but simplicity is really where it's at right now melody as far as the hooks and things like that they're really important a lot of people not rapping it's not hip-hop anymore it's like hip-hop has changed in itself I always look at it like hip hop is like, think about the clothes, right? So every year is a different different style of something that come out every so often. And like baggy jeans was one thing, now it's baggy t-shirts, but then it was, the, now it's tight everything, right? So music is the same thing. They go through changes and, you know, right now it's just a simple, they don't care too much about a lot of changes and a lot of music being involved in it. Musicality is not, you know, it's not the forefront of everything, but simplicity is. And feeling. They go a lot off feel, you know? Just it's just I wish that it would change up a little. Make it a little bit more interesting. Um, I've been listening to Travis Scott album a lot. I like the diversity in it. Musically, I really like the the diversity in the music. And I can appreciate it. Like him and Ray Shrimmer is like my first, they like my favorites right now, right? There's a lot of, I don't know, man, it's like a lot of the same sounds and people ain't just, they not stepping outside. So, you know, it's hard to judge it, you know? It's hard to really judge it. I think it's growing constantly. It's going to forever grow. But there's nothing I can't do. So (laughs) I'm not listening to it like, fuck, how did they do that, right? I'm not listening to it that way. So, so. I think that's a thing too. Being able to say, if it'll change where you can't do it, then that's a difference. That's a problem. But it's not changing to where we can't pick up on what's happening. It's like you know what's happening. You know how to do it. I know what they're doing. It's not a secret, you know. So, so speaking of secrets, back in uh, 2016, I think when when you and I first had a conversation via Twitter, right off of the heels of of our work on layers. You tweeted out what's Beat Stars, and now here we are in, in 2018, and you're partnering with Beat Stars, and you're ready to, to launch an online production catalog. What what made you want to make beats available to the public, given that you have such a legacy in the industry, working with legendary artists? What made you want to make that transition? Because I feel like there's no rules anymore, and I'm sick of seeing so many people that are on high ass courses act like they can't do stuff like that. Like you know what I mean? It's like I understand that you got to like get to a point where how do you find the next artist that way? I don't have time to go. I'm not going to sit in a club and, and, and party till I can't wake up the next day. It's not, you know, it's almost, I'm not going to the, to the new studios. Like I work in my space. I like my space and I like, I like my routine. Right. And I like working with new people. And I think, first of all, like I had the idea a long time ago when I was put, I had a site where I was pushing music. Through, you know, through my site. And EMI and all the publishing companies was trying to shut it down, right? They was like, well, you can't sell this and you can't do this and you can't do this. And I'm like, well, you work for me though, right? So if that's the case, why aren't you going to get that money from all these kids that's buying the music? 
And once I realized how much of a ruse it was, it was like they collect, but they don't work for you. You don't bring me anything you'll do. And so once I got tired of that, I was like, to see beat stars doing it and it's working the way it's working, man, look, it's the future to me. Everybody can't get on a plane to come to Detroit. You know, everybody can't get on a plane to come to where you are and, and get your music. You know what I mean? Like, you have a sound that, that that I love. You know what I'm saying? So I know how to get in contact with you. Everybody might not know that, right? Like, so I wanted to make that available. I'm not, I can have every diamond record in the world and still feel disconnected. So I don't want to feel disconnected from the culture. I want to, like, you know, I feel like everybody should be doing that. Everybody should be doing it. Because that's how you find the next person. That's how you bridge the gap. I don't want these producers or artists to ever feel like I didn't, I, I got, you know, I'm he and he, he on his, he on his island and he don't really, he don't really fuck with us like that. I don't want it to be that. So this to me is a dope way to work with new artists that I don't even know. I would love to hear some shit of mine where it's like, oh, that's a hit. Oh, okay, cool. That's dope. Good for him. Good for us, right? <laughs> like, it's, that's cool. That's cool. So, and sometimes, man, I don't like working with people that's got, that's already on. They already have a, because they already have a pre, they already have like this attitude, like, you know, like they, they know what they're doing and they haven't done a thing yet, you know? And sometimes you don't want to really deal with that. Sometimes you want to deal with the people that are, really trying to make it and their ideas are a lot better because they don't they don't have no rules so i wanted to work with people like that and this was a great way to do it. these stars is a great way to do it I'm, I'm glad you uh mentioned that emi situation so you were signed to emi publishing i was signed to emi publishing they, they got bought out by sony <clears throat> i was in a serious 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 deal because you gotta think i sold probably eight million records just as an artist in my in my group Having all of the record sales, like they wasn't, and I was holding up a lot of the deal. Like I was the reason a lot of that was moving because I was producing and doing all of those things. They held me in a, in a real fucked up deal for a long time. And thankfully, um, actually, Rich Christina was, uh, and the people, my team, like my management, um, my lawyer, Lisa, um, man, she really worked her ass off to get me out of that situation. <clears throat> I mean, to change it. So it, it wouldn't, you know, but they, but, but the years before that, I had to go through that. I did Bad Means Evil. I bought that to him. I bought it to Big John before he left there. And was like, yo, I got this album. I did 60% of it. Kid you not. Produced 60% of it purposely, right? Like, I just put my head down and kept going. And I bought it to him. I was like, look, I need to get out of this situation. I should be in this totally different thing. And he left. I didn't even hear from them after that. And, you know, we'll get to that at one point. I, I tell that story, but it, it was an uphill battle, man. And I had to realize that those people, they just move on to who hot. They don't care what you're doing. They just, whoever's hot at the moment, that's what's happening. And I'm doing whole albums, and they so used to me being in that situation that they thought it was. they thought I was okay with it, and I'm not. I never, I never had to recoup anything because I was always recouped. I was make, just sitting there making money, and they was getting a huge percentage of it because of the deal that they had me in since I was, you know, younger, right? So when I started doing the beat site, I just wanted to work with some new people. I got tired of the industry hoopla. I was like, man, I can go work with the people that I like, but I mean. How hard is it to me to work with big people when I got when I helped build one of the biggest artists today? You know, so it's not like the, I have. And then I got Royce, who's like the next best thing. Like nobody can out rap that dude. It's like I got the absolute best. I don't care what people say. So I work with the absolute best. So it don't make no sense for me to go out here running around chasing everybody. I told Two Chains that I was like, man, I don't, I'm not running around chasing everything. I love Two Chains. That's my dude. Like. I work with two chains any day. But he was like, yo, man, you still doing this? Like, yeah, but why the fuck would I, why am I going to play that game? I don't want to be a crab in the bucket. I'm special. I'm not going to act like I'm not special. You know? So if people want that, like, they come to me and get it. You know? I don't have to run after it. And I like new artists because 
they don't have this ego like you don't they doing you a favor by wrapping that, up your that, that's I interesting because like street I, I spoke to street runner and i spoke to jay reed as i said and, and i and i actually assumed that incorrectly assumed that um perhaps jay reed had entered into some kind of publishing situation i mentioned to him that street runner said after his negative experience with a publisher that he would never sign another co-publishing deal and yeah. then i brought that up to jay reed i said are, are you signed to a publisher immediately he said no and i'm not trying to <laughs> so i, I wonder said, if what did he say? He said, no. yeah he, he said no he said he's been approached but he's just he's focused on figuring out how to um be his own admin so yeah that's a tough game you can use it for administration but they need to re they need to reform their structure if anything I'll tell you this. At a certain point, I'm going to move into a, an executive seat, right? Anything I feel like I want to do in this business, I feel like I'm able to do because I learned every aspect of it, right? I've, I've dabbled with the idea of working in publishing, but I will work with them to show them how to connect to some of these producers. They don't even know how to play the game right because you got a whole bunch of people that's like they just fans of the music. And they can tell you everything about down to the person that played on it and all of that. They got ev they know everybody's story. Everybody got a story. And that's what they sell it. It's stories, right? But I think they missing a whole boat. Like, why are you not connecting these artists with um, you know, with products? Why aren't you doing those things? Like it'll make you money. But they just like having a company car, going to lunch. And following whoever did whatever song. If you think about it, every month right now is a new producer. That's the hot thing. Then it stops. Right? Then it's the next person. But it's only because they got this song that they produce for somebody. They wine and dine that artist, that producer. And they don't sell them shit. They don't tell them a goddamn thing. They don't give them no kind of knowledge that'll help them go further. Right? He's just a name. And he got a million kids. That'll buy his music because he produced a song for Drake or he produced a song for Eminem or he produced a song for whoever, Travis Scott, whoever. And th that's what happened. I don't think it should go like that. Those same artists and those same producers, I have plenty of ideas of how to market them in their own way. Producers are just as important as artists. I think you just got to be creative with how it works, you know, and how you want to work in this business. And I think publishing companies, just got to change their structure. It's time. Everybody else changing. Okay, speaking of, of structural change in the music industry, I think this is an interesting nexus of ideas that, that, that we both have. In talking to a lot of internet producers, you know, there used to be this, this line in the sand drawn and between internet producers, industry producers, I feel like the waves have, have washed a lot of that, that line away. Um, but what I've noticed in talking to producers who have made their, their brands on the internet before you know the traditional capital i industry w once they get into the placement game they're used to making you know th the top sellers they're used to making 10 to 15,000 off a beat that they upload to youtube right and yeah. so when it com without giving up their copyright without giving up their masters without compromising it's their brand and mm -hmm. so when they enter into an agreement with a label suddenly they're faced with a contract that's work for hire sometimes sometimes there are these other um, sacrifices they have to make just to get that placement, and they're resistant to it. So having seen all that you've seen, and especially now that, that you're on both sides of, of that line, do you, do you think that the, the practices of the industry are going to change because of this new Internet landscape? It better, or they're going to just lose money. They just slow. They do everything after the fact, and then when they finally do something, then that becomes a wave, and it's important for people to be a part of a label, and then they go back to doing the regular shit the wrong way. And then they need people like us. Here's the thing. I, like, somebody, like, people I respect, like, people like Steven Victor, right? I met him on tour um, recently. And my questions to him are like, yo, how do you make the transition from this to this? That's all I want to know is how do you make this trend? How did you make this transition from yada, yada, yada? I need to pick a brain every once in a while, right? Like Steve Stout. I respect people like that, you know, or shit, a Dre, like, right? 
if they don't change, if label don't change, like normally what they do is they watch, 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 and then a wave hit, and then they're like, oh, we surfing. Here we go, we surfing with you. And they act like they with you, and then once they figure out how they making the money, then they stay on that wave until that wave get low until you figure out, the artist or the producer, figure out what's the next thing. I'd say to any of those producers, like, you know, people is mad at the type producers, like, oh, type beat producers. I love them. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Because they figured out a way to market themselves without nobody. I'm with them. <laughs> I don't care nothing about how, oh, they don't use this drum machine or they don't use this. Like, man, shut up. Who cares? They doing something you ain't doing and you should be. The only thing I want to do is school them and show them, like, yo, this is how you take it further. Right? That's all I want to do. I don't, I don't got no problem with what they do. I have none at all. Actually, the craziest part is, I have some other ideas, my own self, of how to even take that further. And I'm just going, because I'm watching them and saying like, oh, okay, that's cool. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. I got other ideas from them. I love them dudes. Any of them can reach out to me any day. Any of those dudes. Because I want to be able to talk to them so I can understand. I'll understand the business more than a label would. Because I'm not afraid of them. I'm not afraid of their change. I'm not going to tell them just because this is what I don't like. A person, let's say, go to jail. Right? One of the homies go to jail. He read a whole bunch of books. He get out, he damn near get mad at you if you ain't doing the same shit he doing. Oh, man, you should be this, you should be this, and you should be doing this, and you should be doing this. It's because sometimes they get that knowledge and it go to their head. Knowledge is supposed to go to your head, but you ain't supposed to force that knowledge on nobody. Just because I have experience, I, ain't, I don't force my experience on people. I don't enforce it on them. Those type producers, all of them, love them all. Love them all, man, like... Because they actually change in the industry. It ain't the industry that's changing it. It's them. It's them and the artists that are fucking with their music. They can Now, they can work better together. I tell you that. One piece of advice I would give them is stop just going straight to a label. Make sure you talk to that artist. Like, yo, I want to make sure I got my 50% as far as the producer. I want you giving that away. I did hook you up. We got some kind of thing going. We obviously got a chemistry. I got more music. They build something, and instead of them going to a label and leaving those producers, build a relationship with them, and then go in there and say, nah, we're going to license you our music. We'll license it to you so you can distribute it that way through your platforms. But we, we still own it. You only get this amount and this and that. But if the artist and the producer did that, game would change. Spotify would have to pay. iTunes would have to pay. All these people have to pay you a totally different way. Because it's not saying, well... This is what their mentality is. I'm a tight beat producer. I got on Lil Wayne or who else used my beat. Man, it's an opportunity of a lifetime. I don't want to miss it. Right? So they don't want to miss an opportunity of a lifetime. So they take whatever comes. That's where they make the mistake. You don't have to. The song is already a hit. At that point, be like, no, fuck you. Give me $3 million. And no, I'm not paying you back. I'm making it anyway. It's mine. As a matter of fact, I'll give me a million dollars. I'll let you license my shit. I'll license it to you for this amount of money. You already got the power. That's what I would tell them. If I was one of them kids right now coming up in that, that's how I would play it. I'm like, man, fuck no. It's already a hit. I don't need you. You don't need them at all. You don't need nobody. They already got to use your platform because if they don't play your song, everybody going to be looking for where it's at. And you know what's going to happen? Then it's going to be another person to come up with a streaming service like Jay-Z and say, no, nah, we'll put it on here. Yeah, no, nah, we'll put it on and pay you the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or whoever. And it'll be somebody else. And then that company will become the next streaming service. That's how it works. Yeah, I'm noticing that a lot of artists are, are taking that route where they're circumventing the labels and just signing some kind of situation with a streaming service. The streaming service in, t in turn gives them extra publicity and, and marketing because they have the built-in audience and it's everything is monetized so yep. you give them the exclusivity to that record and suddenly you and everybody involved in that project is, is yeah. splitting the profits from five million streams and think about it that's way better than making what it what it, let's see how many streams is it and some people begin to check for eight thousand dollars and they be having a zillion gazillion streams it's like what how it's the that's a ruse bro so, you know, they should they should be smart. I think 
those type beat producers, those artists that kind of go to those, I don't care about going to the studio. If you don't want to go in the studio, we ain't got to go in the studio. It's actually a learning experience, and it's a great experience. Cause I'm, but records ain't even taking that long. We're not even considering taking Listen, we did. Kamikaze was done in four months. If that. It started the minute, the, the, the first song on the album, The Ringer, was the very first song recorded for that album. Well, mm -hmm. maybe second, but first technically, right? And he did that record and it was going, 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 going. Didn't have to tell nobody your album coming out. I don't care. You already you, so it don't matter. Just put it out. I was like, bro, what, we what do you need to announce it for? You're you. This is the new wave. And now his mentality is like, man, I can put a record out for every four months if I wanted to. <laughs> You know, because he, he see how it works. And sometimes you just got to step out there and do it. But don't nobody care. that Nobody take that long no more. We don't need to take long. So I like the fact that these guys can come up with something and a hit a song will be a hit song. Now, the content in itself, producers got to start caring more about their shit. Because you don't want to be the guy that's like, oh, I produced this song. It's a huge song, but it's known for a huge negative thing. Right. Let's say the person is a super negative person. Right. And they always doing something. Now you tied to that as a producer. Now you can't you go a little embarrassed to say like, well, I produced this person. So, you know, start caring about what they call what they're talking about. You know, don't take every little thing. Once you get a little bit of a name, I think if they do, if you land a couple of joints, if you land, a, if somebody is landing a couple of joints, at least. I would say just don't care. Don't don't let everybody just rap on your shit at that point. You know, be more selective. Okay, so so speaking of of uh, being selective and releasing music, I I heard uh, in this email chain that that led up to this conversation we're having now that that you are working on a new is it a project? Is it an album a solo project? It's a it's a solo project, yeah, and it's gonna be different than any solo project because it's, it's like sometimes I'm a rap, sometimes I'm a sing, sometimes I'm just producing the song. Like whatever happened, happened. It's not whole. It's not all the way. I, I ain't got like three verse songs, like all that shit. Like it's a whole different music experience. It's like almost like a mixtape of a different person, but it's the same person, and it just it's a whole different. It's, it's a different way to do albums, and I don't care. I'm just fucking doing it. I don't care, cause at this point, I harbor more music than anything. Cause you know you listen to people and they like. They, you know, you put out a record, man. Like, you know, you put a song out and people be like, oh, I didn't like that beat. And it's like, you ain't never made a beat in your life. How do you, like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, they then they critique it. Like, oh, this mix don't sound right. Like, what? What are you talking about? And they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and they never made a beat. And you got to hear this. It's almost like walking through, um, walking through art exhibits or walking through, let's say, uh, um, you know, like when the city have, they have their little exhibit and people displaying their art. A million people walk by their shit. But that one person that buys something, they're super thankful for that person. Because a million people might even go look at this painting and be like, oh, this is scary looking. And they say it out loud. Art is sitting right there. Right? So we think we got it bad from comments. Just imagine those artists that got to sit there in a booth and sell their shit. Right? Mm -hmm. So it makes me a little comp. I had a complex for a very long time, I think, after proof. Because I was working on an album when he died that I was actually about to put out on a major situation. And all of that changed because I was like, man, I'm not. Fuck that. I'm straight. I was over it. So right now, what I have is just I'm happy with it. It's fun and it's serious. And I'm talking. I'm talking my shit. And, but I'm doing what I want to do. And so, so this project is going to, you're releasing it yourself or you haven't even gotten to that point. You're, you're just focused on the creative process. Like just, I know that I can release it now. When I release a song, if I got a song and forgot a song with whoever I choose is on the song, I know I can release it however I want and it'll, it'll reach the, you know, it'll reach, it'll have a good reach to it. So now knowing that, it's a lot easier to do. So I'm just right now just finishing it. Because we just got our tour, so I'm kind of just now getting back into finish writing. It takes a minute for me to get into that mode. Because I'm in a producer mode or whatever mode I'm in. Sometimes writing is the hardest because 
you're not moved by a lot of shit. Yeah, it's a it's a full full length project, man. All right, so for the people that want to check that project out when it's when it's done and get updates, then for the producers that want to soak up the knowledge, and also artists that want access to your catalog once it's out, how do they follow you? How do they contact you? How do they interact with you online? Um, just do like in Instagram and Twitter. Like, it's I think it's both of them is Denondos. Um, and then I have a website that's uh, just Denon.com or. And it's always update updates through that, but social media is pretty much just that's the way. Like you know, it's like the calling card for everything. So you'll see. I, I'm for me. I'm like we doing. I'm even writing comedy skits right now. <clears throat> so I'm actually writing a show, comedy show. And it's just a it's just a different way of doing it. Like Instagram TV. Um, it'll be like an Instagram TV thing. Uh, and it's almost like a mixtape of funny skits. You know how you like go through Instagram, you go through and you might see a thing here. Th- just imagine getting hit with one, like literally three to five minutes of just a show. That's the show. No commercial, but the skits. All of the funny skits compiled. And, I, and we got we working with a lot of comedians that are like Instagram comedians or social media comedians. But me and my man Dennis, um, his name's I Punk Puppies on Instagram. So uh, we uh, we just been writing a lot of the skits and action. I'm acting in them and we write. So it's it's fun and it's funny. And it's, so while I'm working on the album, I'm doing that. Well, you sound busy, so I'll, I'll let you go for the evening. Appreciate you sitting down and sharing that history yeah. with us, sharing the, those experiences with us, and, and definitely appreciate you uh, being a, a bold voice. In, in today's industry when so much is is convoluted and there's so much white noise. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, we'll, we'll have to check in again very shortly. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. I want to send need, you need more need ideas. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it's going to happen because you sent the tweet out in, in 2016. Yeah. Um, so we have to we have to make good on, on that promise to the people. So man, we'll, we we'll make to. that happen. We have to, bro. I right, appreciate you once again, bro. Peace. Thank you, man. Peace.